Uh, hello. Um, I. I believe we've started. Uh, my name's Danny Dubois, uh, and I'll be talking about whip speeches. Um, so uh, broadly, uh, the reason I like whip speeches so much and gave them was I felt it was uh, one of the most fun speeches to give from a debate strategy perspective that all the arguments have already been made and around, you know exactly where the round has gone. And all you have to do is the whip speakers explain why, given everything that's been said, uh, your team wins the round. So it's a lot of strategy, a lot of interactions between teams, thinking on your feet, um, and no surprises as well. Um, so uh, overall, I'll go through uh, what you should think about, ways of making your whip speeches better. But I'd also just want to note that most of this is advice and things that I figured uh, work best for me, but it doesn't mean that everything I'm saying would work for everyone. Um, so uh, it's important to just uh, try things out and make sure you get a lot of practice, figure out what works for you. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is what does a closing team need to do to win a debate? Because you have to think about uh, your role in that position in order to think about then what a good whip speech does. So the first thing, obviously, is you have to win your extension or the new contribution your team is making to the debate. And that involves two questions in particular, and people often forget the second one. So the first is, why is your extension new? Why hasn't it been said uh, by your opening? But then the second is, why is your extension important? So um, maybe your opening team didn't talk about in a foreign policy motion um, relations with uh, Iran or something. But unless you prove why Iran is an important enough actor that uh, you should be paying attention to them, then your extension doesn't actually help you win that debate. So making sure you prove not just why your extension's new, but also why it should be the focus of the debate and carries either the biggest impact or covers the most amount of examples in the motion is important to making sure you uh, win the debate. Um, and then the second thing you want to do after winning the extension is just make sure you refute the other teams and their contributions to the debate with good rebuttal, um, particularly the two teams across from you. Uh, and I think the whip speech often does a lot of that in particular, the refutation. So um, second thing is then given that overall mission of a closing team, what does the whip speech do in particular? Um, I've hinted at this in my introduction, but basically you take what's been said and explain why it means you win. So you're not adding really that much new constructive at all, that most of this has already been presented by your partner in the member's speech. And instead, what you're doing is you might impact the extension a little bit more. So maybe describe uh, what exactly happens to the people who are affected by it, or how this changes relations between country countries or why your principle behind the extension is the most important principle that takes precedence over other concerns. And then with that, you also explain its significance to the round. So if you're the likeliest to preserve a diplomatic solution to terrorism or something, um, that means you win because you're the only team that allows for uh, long-term ends to conflicts rather than just mitigating conflicts and preserving a little bit of security or something like that. Um, so you want to further, uh, the other thing you'll do though is further develop the underexplained parts of the extension. So if you're, an extension has multiple logical links, but your partner is perhaps uh, not fully explaining one of the assumptions behind it, you might add a little bit of material fully explaining that piece of analysis. Um, and then uh, obviously you answer the refutation to your web speech as well. <clears throat> so that's how you develop the extension. And then also you have to refute the other closing team, particularly when you're GovWhip refuting the closing op extension, you wanna make sure you have a lot of time devoted towards answering them. Um, you add refutation to the opening teams. And then broadly, the last thing you do as a whip speech is you tie up loose ends. So if there are any arguments floating around in the debate that your partner hasn't answered or you think could be turned into something um, in a deliberation to something that wins one of the other teams the rounds, um, you as the whip speaker, really want to make sure that you uh, devote your time towards finding what those arguments are and giving precise answers to them. So you kind of have to be almost paranoid in a way, making sure you answer everything. Um, so third thing I want to talk about is, given all of that, uh, how do you structure a whip speech? Because a lot of the times people give very messy speeches um, or don't really know how to address all of these things while making sure they win. So um, the first way I would recommend, and this was sort of my default, is structure the whip speech by team. 
So let's say you're the opwip speaker. What you might do is you start uh, with the closing opposition extension, and in that you explain what the extension was, why it was distinct and beats your opening op team. Uh, in this process, also answering any refutation that has been made to your extension, either in the gov whip or in the form of a POI. Um, after you do that, you go to the closing gov extension, add refutation there, explain why your partner's refutation of the extension wasn't well addressed, answer anything about how the extension shifted in the whip speech. And then the third thing you do is uh, refute um, all the OG material that's left as well. And when you're also dealing with the two gov teams, you might also explain why your extension is more important or interacts with the material they brought. So the speech becomes very clearly something like, here's why we beat opening op, here's why we beat closing gov, here's why we beat opening gov, therefore we take the one. And um, uh, that might change a little bit. So for example, if you're gov whip, I would recommend instead starting with closing opposition's extension and rebutting that because that's the only chance your team has towards dealing with that. And then you might wanna do something like uh, shift the order of what you're doing based on the strengths and weaknesses of either the teams or your partner's speech. So for example, if you think that uh, you have a very good extension, but it's unclear whether you're refuting really good material from the government teams, maybe your whip speech starts with refutation and then covers your extension at the end. Um, either way, uh, just making sure you uh, have some sort of clear structure that's like team one, team two, team three, we beat all of them can help. Um, the benefits to this approach are it's very formulaic, so you don't need to stress each time about how you're going to break down the round um, because it's the same way every single time. Um, it also helps judges when they talk about the bench comparisons and the uh, team comparisons to be like, we have very clear reasons why uh, closing op or closing gov thinks they beat X or Y or Z team. Um, do we think that's true? But you at least start them off on the right discussion and flag to them what they should be paying attention to. And then the other thing I think about this approach that I like that um, I think a lot of whip speakers forget is it really makes sure you think about your speech in terms of winning a debate format that has four teams. Um, a lot of whip speeches that just broadly talk about issues in the debate will sometimes just try to prove why uh, their side beats the other side rather than why their team beats not only the other side, but both specific teams on the other side and also your opening as well. Because you wanna make sure you're, you're uh, positioning yourself in relation to all those teams rather than just broadly talking about the debate. Because if you do that, then you risk being derivative of your opening or relying on material they brought. Um, you also risk in refuting the op teams, uh, implicitly refuting one way more than the other rather than delineating what their two object, uh, objectives and contributions were. Um, but there's some weaknesses to this approach too. Uh, it risks being repetitive, um, particularly if all the teams are talking about the same issues and just saying different things about them. And it can end up becoming disorganized if that means different parts of the speech blend into each other. So you wanna make sure you're careful with this as well. It's by no means the only answer and it's not the only way I gave a speech. Um, the other way you can break down a web speech is organize the round according to certain themes. Um, the one that I think often is the best or easiest to do is organizing it by type of impact. So perhaps the first is um, everything every team has said about economic growth. Then second, everyone everything everyone has said about economic inequality. Or perhaps you talk about um, domestic implications of the foreign policy motion, and then you talk about international implications or something, or um, who better reduces financial risk and then who's better for economic growth or something. Um, that helps because the judge often, I think intuitively, will think about the round in terms of what are the outcomes that each team is trying to achieve and then who achieves them and which side gets them and then which outcomes are the most important. So when you organize your speech that way, you do it along the, the lines of decision calculus that the judge themselves will have. Um, another similar way of doing this, but a little bit different, is just break down the motion into the different scenarios or decision trees that could result. So for example, if it's a sanctions topic, perhaps the first half of your web speech deals with the world in which uh, countries comply with the sanctions and why that's good or bad. And then the second is, 
um, you deal with the world in which the countries don't comply and the sanctions are actually imposed and explain why that's good or bad and why your team wins. And that helps you separate sort of the, the different worlds in which certain thing could happen and explain why under any of them you still win the debate. Um, the benefit to this is I think this is the more intuitive approach that people just think about debate in terms of the issues and who better achieves them. And sometimes it can also be a lot clearer than trying to organize the speech based on teams when every team is talking about the same thing. Um, but the drawback, as I sort of mentioned before, is that it becomes much easier to lose track of each individual team. That if you're just organizing your whip speech based on issues, you still want to be very clear um, what opening op versus closing op said and what you said versus your opening team, rather than just broadly saying like the opposition or the government or not even mentioning teams and only talking about the arguments because you have a very specific mission of not just proving your side of the motion more persuasive than the other, but specifically explaining why your team's contribution was the most valuable contribution. Um, so those are the, the broad pieces of advice for structure. Um, what I would suggest for uh, what I'm going to do next is just explain sort of the timeline of the round and things you should think about during each part of the round uh, to make sure that you're uh, preparing for the whip speech um, effectively. So uh, during prep time, what I'd recommend is both you and your partner think about possible extensions. Um, so this means just trying to come up with all the arguments on the debate. But what it also means, and one thing that really helped for me, is just spend a lot of time asking each other questions about what the motion looks like in different circumstances. So if it's a foreign policy motion, try to list every country that's relevant and then just ask each other questions like, how does this country play into it? How does this country play into it? Or if it's a social justice motion, try to consider each different stakeholder or the various degrees of people uh, related to the motion. So if it's about women, maybe talk about different types of women. So like single women versus women of color, um, married women, et cetera, rich women, poor women, um, and see how that relates to uh, the different ways you can generate content. And you should almost think of the prep time not as uh, not as like just trying to come up with arguments or just trying to think of why the op wins, but more of a conversation because that can help you often get the new lens or the type of deep analysis that is less likely to be burned by an opening team. Um, and another thing you can do is when you have all these arguments laid out, just think of... <clears throat> different ways to frame or package the argument as well in case you need to run something substantively similar uh, to the government team or your opening team, but uh, a little bit different. So perhaps you're making similar arguments about why regional integration is good, but you explain it in the context of um, specifically why we want uh, a national government uniting a bunch of countries rather than some type of regional agreement. So like, um, instead of why we should have a, a, an African Union, we should have the United States of Africa. And you explain your arguments, prove the difference between that, even if they're very similar to uh, the openings team's arguments, um, that difference can be enough to push you over. Um, or like perhaps you add analysis explaining why we're proving why all of this is the most important right now. So we add a level of imperative uh, to a motion about climate change or something that uh, the, the opening team didn't address. So even those little framing devices that allow you to make very similar arguments, you can then explain when the, when the round. Um, so talking and really just thinking and keeping an open mind is important. You shouldn't really try to s settle on any extensions because you need to see where the round is going to go. Um, during the speeches of the team that's right in front of you, so your opening team, uh, your job as the whip speaker should be to pay very, very close attention to and take very detailed notes of their arguments, um, and more so than your partner. And the reason is because if the round comes down to a situation of opening government and closing government or opening op and closing op, talk about very similar issues, and it's just did closing prove the argument better than opening, or were the reasons closing gave to support the income, the impact, more important than the reasons opening gave. Um, that comes down a lot to bench work, explicitly explaining 
the explanations for each arguments and why your explanations were more nuanced than the others. And if you can talk about in detail what exactly your opening said and why it didn't sufficiently prove the motion, that can help you a lot. Um, your partner's job, uh, after the first speaker on your opening team finishes their speech, they should decide sort of what the likeliest extension is going to be for your team to run, and they should start preparing it. Um, they should obviously check in with you to make sure you agree as well, and you should have a conversation, particularly in between speeches where no one's talking, so you two can talk uh, without having to multitask. But you should try to guess what you think the extension will probably be, noting that you should also keep an open mind in case uh, in case the shifts during the next speech. So then after the second speech from your opening, you'll confirm for sure what you think the extension should be. And then your partner should fully finish preparing the extension and writing it out. Um, during the speeches of the team that's diagonal from you, so either the short or long diagonal, depending on what side you are, um, your job should be to write as much refutation of their arguments as possible. And sort of just as they're going, uh, it, it doesn't mean you're going to read from that sheet specifically and just read everything you say. But what helps is if you come up with the refutation now, you have something you can quickly look back on. Because as the round shifts, you're going to be needing to write other things as well, like refutation to the extension, um, explanation of your partner's extension, etc. Um, so getting this done now is good as well. And also what you can do is then just give the stuff you write to your partner so they can decide what to include in their speech. And then you can include the rest in your speech as well. And obviously you won't have time to make every response you generate, but some of them are gonna be taken by your opening and then others um, your partner might make. So just trying to come up with everything as possible is the best. So really thinking about your job as generating refutation is important as your partner is developing the extension. Um, if you're closing up um, during the member of government, I think generally uh, as a whip speaker, you should be very cognizant of the fact that uh, the member of opposition, I think, is one of the hardest speeches to give um, because they have to refute not only uh, the speech right before them, the extension speech, but also opening government a little. And also they have to explain why the extension's new. And more so than the gov whip, there's a higher threshold for what counts as new during the op whip. So the member of op has to make sure they get a lot out in a very short amount of time to make sure that uh, your team has a chance of winning. So in one way in which you can be accommodating because they're prepping a lot is making sure that you're also writing refutation to the closing of extension and helping prepare your partner's speech rather than sort of leaving them on, a lo on, on their own and not listening. Um, so that can help ease the burden as well. Um, so then after either member of gov speaks, or if you're closing gov, uh, the DLO speaks, you should check in with your partner one more time to confirm the specific structure of the speech. And that way you know what to listen to and also how to start organizing your speech as well. But you never want to be totally blindsided with how your partner goes about structuring the speech or what's going to come out of their mouth. Um, so you can know what to expect as it's coming. Um, during your partner's speech, uh, it's very important to pay close attention to what they're doing well and also what's weak um, because you want your speech to be a complement of what that is. So if they explain one of your arguments really well, you shouldn't be spending more than 10, 20 seconds on it, um, re-explaining it because your partner's already done that. And then if the argument is not explained well, um, then that's what you want to spend a lot of time on your speech. Or if they're impacting seemed a little bit uh, far-fetched or exaggerated, then your speech wants to really spend a lot of time explaining how the impact's concrete and realistic and likely. Um, so you wanna make sure that uh, you're devoting time towards fixing the specific parts of their speech that are, are good versus bad um, and not just like repeating the same stuff as well. So I think a lot of people sometimes during their partner's speeches focus on writing their own speeches, but you wanna make sure you're listening as well. Um, then after the speech right after your partner, so the government whip if you're closing op or the member of opposition if you're closing gov, um, you wanna pay a lot of attention to anything new that that speaker is bringing into the round. So obviously that's the closing op extension. And then in government whip, it's refutation of your extension, but also maybe it might be hints of a whip extension or something. Um, that's the most important material for you to hit in your speech 
because it's the material that only you have a chance of answering that everything else your partner might have answered or like maybe another team will have dealt with in some way that it falls out of the round but um the way you can really jeopardize your ability to win rounds as a closing team is if the whip speaker doesn't handle new good material from the speaker right before them so make sure you're paying extra close attention towards that and dealing with that um and then the last piece of advice for throughout the round is uh in general, I think I both did this, and I think I've seen other teams do this too. Uh, the whip speaker often asks more POIs, um, and this is because your partner, until their extension, is consistently prepping writing the extension. And then the only time that should switch is then the speech right before your speech, where they should be asking POIs because then you have to write a lot in a short amount of time. Um, but obviously that depends on the partnership as well, but something to keep in mind as well. Also make sure you do things like write out POIs, um, to make sure that they're delivered well and quickly and succinctly in a clear way. Um, so that's the timeline of the round. Um, I'm going to answer, uh, one question that I saw right now, which is what would be the best way to show why the closing won and did things better than the opening? And I think there are several ways you can do that. So. The first could just be based on the different actors you chose to talk about. So let's say it's a Siri emotion. Maybe you could explain um, the most important actor to talk about is Turkey because it shares a border, it has a ton of military capacity, it uh, houses a lot of refugees in the area, and it plays a big role in determining whether there's force to stop Assad or actually there's force supporting Assad or something. You can say like all of those are reasons why your extension about how this policy with relation to the Kurds hurts relations to Turkey is the most important analysis in the round, given how important the actor is. Um, another thing you can do is just take normal weighing metrics and explain why your extension is more important along those lines. So probability, you could just explain why like you've given a likelier account of what's going to happen. So like opening gov may be true, but they focus on sort of far-fetched impacts. Magnitude, so like um, you've your extension impacts more people or has a bigger harm. Um, you could talk about like uh, time. So like your extension shows that this is a more immediate concern, whereas opening gov only talks about distant impacts that aren't as relevant or the reverse, like, you show a longer term harm than your opening government. And that's more important because, and then the last thing you can do, and this is sort of what you would have to do if, if their opening gov is very similar to you or opening up is explain why what they said was similar, but what you said is more important. So for example, um, in a round about like parent child relationships, um, an opening gut, we set up from closing, uh, that an opening gov team proved why this thing parents should do would not actually help their children. And then we ran stuff that was similar, but we framed it as opening gov proves why this wouldn't help children. We prove it would actively hurt them and hurt the parent child's relationship that is so important to helping children grow up and become fully functional adults. Um, so we win over them because we've proven a more important concern or we've better proven this argument. Um, so it's almost almost kind of like um, like logical reasoning, like have they sufficiently proven premises and conclusions, explaining why they had some missing link in their chain of proof that you filled in, and therefore you have to win because the argument wasn't complete until your analysis. Um, so thinking about that. Or like maybe in a round about um, Saudi Arabia and its recent direction under MBS, you could say, um, they talk a lot about why economic reform is good, but they don't prove why the specific economic policies that MDS, MBS has adopted uh, would be actually helpful in helping these people. So it, we're going to explain in detail why those are, what those are and why they work and why they would help this country so much, and then why that outweighs any of the other concerns about why it might be bad. Um, so uh, doing that as well uh, can help you win over your, your opening team. Um, so hope that helps. Please uh, keep sending questions. Um, there's one I see that I'll address towards the end. Um, but uh, so next thing, fifth thing I want to talk about is team unity and working with your partner. Um, so team unity is really important uh, in being a closing team, more so than opening, that you two are really 
evaluated and your contributions evaluated together rather than sort of just each speaker can say things. And as long as there's something that wins the debate from one of you, you win the round that. Um, in rounds when you're closing, it really matters, did the member deliver a good extension and then the, did the whip speech carry it through and explain why it's so important. And part of that is really on you to trust your partner and communicate with them and work with what they're giving with you rather than consistently hoping they'll be better, hoping that they say the things you want them to say. Um, so the first thing under this is it's really important to whip the extension. Uh, regardless of how you structure your speech or what order you decide to do it, it needs to be a big part of your speech to say what the extension was, what, what its key points were, how was it responded to, why wasn't it sufficiently responded to, and why is its impact so important. And one thing to just do to make sure you're doing that is like, think about how many times in your speech are you mentioning your partner by name and, and referring to the parts of their speech that were said. Because if you're not doing that at least once or twice a minute, then you're probably not giving a good speech that's bringing through what they said and explaining why it wins. Um, it's also really valuable to uh, point out concessions whenever possible, particularly of your best material. And then even more so when you're gov whip, and you can say like, this was not responded to in the last speech. I would love to hear what new things the op whip has to say about it. Um, Cause then you kind of clarify to the judges that like any refutation that does come is too late in the round. And then I'd also recommend incorporating the idea or theme of your extension into your introduction in some way. So if it's like around about um, uh, ethnicity and giving different ethnicities different states or something after conflict or whatever, um, and you're running some extension about how ethnicity isn't actually salient, it's political features that cause ethnic conflict, um, you might want to start your extension or your web speech with some type of uh, introduction that refers to that idea and says, we're the only team that analyzes why ethnic conflict actually happens. And then that is a good lead in to why you come above all the teams. And it's a lead in that focuses on analysis that your extension brought specifically. Um, so next thing is then how new is new in terms of what can you say that your partner hasn't said? And I think broadly the, the metric you should use is how much does your analysis shift the direction of the debate? So if your partner as MO completely drops closing government and then you spend four minutes answering their extension, that's not great because it was a clear lack in your partner's speech and the closing gov team has no idea uh, where you were gonna go based on that speech. So you don't wanna do that. But if your partner spends one minute on closing gov and then you spend like two minutes, that's fine, even though it's obvious you're probably adding material in that analysis, it is still directionally similar to what your partner was gonna do. So it's like a little bit new, but it isn't um, terrible. Um, and then your new material should also be tied enough to the extension speech that someone could have reasonably expected you to go there. Um, there's the obvious question of like, what happens if uh, my partner doesn't answer anything? And then you're kind of in a, a catch 22 because like, you're probably not going to do too well in that round and you should talk to your partner about why they're not answering anything. But at the same time, what you can do is try to find answers out of the things they did say, or at least try to make it sound like more of what you're saying came from their speech, even if you're being like a little bit loose with the definition of what was in their speech or what they framed as refutation. But the biggest piece of advice is don't jump ship and go completely new, but try to salvage something out of their speech. Because if you go completely new, even if you think it's your only hope, judges will probably discredit it anyways, particularly in situations where it's clear something needed to be in their speech. So like if your partner doesn't refute the closing of extension at all, um, it, it hurts you in a way that like maybe you wanna focus on other things like focusing on beating your opening uh, two teams or something, but and, and also trying to make responses, like don't give up, but uh, you wanna be somewhat similar. Um, so then what do you do if your partner messes up the extension or the extension doesn't come out the way you want to hear it? Um, in general, my advice is be flexible. So like if it's a situation where you had two extensions at two possible extensions and your partner picked one, but you wanted them to pick the other, uh, 
don't do what so many people do and just like whip the other extension even though it was never said because you get zero credit for that it doesn't matter if you think it was better because the judges didn't hear it in the first speech like in that situation you can be mad at your partner later but you just have to go with what they said and develop it to the best of your ability um and you can try to improve what they say so you can give different examples you can give a different account of what the impact is or maybe you can use different language that more persuasively describes the same idea. Um, but you wanna try to use what they say because you'll get always more credit for that than just going completely uh, off the wire and doing something else. And then if they don't have any extension, my advice is like try to create one out of whatever refutation or whatever they did say, but like try to at least make a valiant effort of basing what you say in their speech, even if you're taking it in new directions. Um, so next common question is, what do I do if my partner and I can't agree on what to run? Um, ultimately, your partner gives the extension speech, which means to an extent they have the final say. And in forming your partnerships, you really have to develop an element of trust in giving them that authority and also um, choosing to like, it finding in yourself the comfort to have them have that ability. Obviously, as the round goes on, you can try to persuade them otherwise of like what the extension should be. But there comes a point at which it's not productive to keep disagreeing over that. And when it's clear that they want to go a certain way and they have good reasons for it, even if you don't agree, it is better for you to spend your time um, making that extension as strong as possible and then talking after the round about whether or not you thought it was a good idea and maybe talking to the judges. But you do have to have that element of trust as a whip speaker um, and going with them. And then the next thing, uh, general piece of advice is communicate with your partner about what their speeches need to do to make your speeches easier. So sometimes in a whip speech, it can feel overwhelming because you have to do bench work and explain why your closing team beats uh, an opening team. You also have to refute the opening team diagonal from you, and then you have to refute the closing team that's right across from you. Um, maybe you want to work out with your partner like what thing they should always make sure they're doing in their speeches so that you don't have to worry about making time for it. So like maybe you say, can you do in your speech in the extension all of the bench work for why we beat opening so that way my speech can focus on refuting the other two teams? Or can you like massacre the closing gov extension so that way my speech is just beating the opening half or something? Um, working that out with your partner, make sure that uh, you have uh, synergy between the two of you, but also that you don't save too much for one speech. Um, and then last piece of advice is if you had multiple extensions, like a two or three point extension, one piece of advice I got that was generally pretty helpful was that the whip speech should just talk about them in opposite order from the member. Because if you assume all the points are equally good, which is why you chose to run multiple, um, your member probably spend most time on what they talked about first and then started to run out of time on the stuff they talked about last. So if you flip the order, then you balance it out by making sure that at the end of the round, an equal amount of time has been spent talking about each of those. Um, that's not always true. Like if one point just doesn't land well, it might be better to not bring it up and just focus on the stuff that did. Um, or maybe you want to spend all your time on like what you think has the best chance of salvaging the round and helping you win. But picking that strategically uh, can help. Um, so just to address some of the questions, um, one question is, how can someone practice whip speeches effectively? So my advice for whip speeches, the first is um, just debate a lot. So either go to a lot of tournaments or try to organize a lot of practice rounds with your team or a nearby college. Try to have someone judge them as well, either in person or over Skype. Um, and just ask for a lot of feedback on your speech and the questions you were making. So asking judges specifically like, um, I was thinking of structuring the speech this way, but I also thought about it this other way. Did you think what I chose was the right answer or something? Or um, if you think you struggle in proving why your closing team beat your opening team, you could ask the judge about that question specifically and see if it were good or not. Um, so do, just engaging in a lot of practice and then watching is good as well. Um, the second thing I'd recommend is just watch videos and then um, 
when you get to uh, the point in the video where the whip speak speaker is supposed to speak, um, pause the video, give the speech yourself, and then and then uh, resume the video and then compare the speech you gave to the speech they gave and see um, what you think is good or bad or like what you think you could learn from their speech as well. That's obviously difficult because you have no idea what the extension is going to be until you watch the video and see what happens. But sometimes that's true of your partner as well. So it could be good practice in some ways. And then one recommendation I have for choosing videos is look up speaker tabs to see rounds where people spoke like 84, 85 and above when they were the whip speaker. And that way you make sure you're watching good rounds as well. Not always, like sometimes people give inflated speaks and then sometimes people give bad speaks to good speeches, but but it's a good metric or heuristic for narrowing down what to focus about. And then the last thing for getting better at whip speeches is just make sure you talk to your partner as well because they probably know what you were trying to say better than anyone else because they actually talked about it with you in prep time. And they're also the person who sees you more than anyone else in the debating community. So consistently saying like, hey, did I like bring through the parts of your speech good or like, did I do this well? And learning from them is a valuable experience as well. Um, next question is, how would you define and what qualifies as a valid extension? Um, when adjus give the credit to the opening saying it was based on their premise, it's the worst. Um, yeah, so I mean, part of this is like, there's no real objective way to decide what's a good extension or not, because it's not like the two teams can clash with each other in the way that like two teams across from each other can. But it really just goes to the question of, first, are there things you're saying that were not said in the opening speech, um, which is somewhat of a factual question, like, like, is this a distinct argument? And then the second thing, and this is important, is is what you say what you're saying that's different more important than uh, what your opening saying as well. So, if opening gov or if the judges say something like um, closing gov makes this extension uh, about this technology in this specific area, but all the arguments they gave are derivative of the same reasons that opening gave. So we gave the win to opening. Perhaps that's because uh, one thing your speech could have done th that it didn't is explain why it's not enough to just generally talk about the mechanisms of this technology and research. Rather, you should specifically talk about it in this context because the technology operates differently in this area or um, this area is where the technology is most likely to be used. So it adds a color and level of impact to the round that makes opening relevant in a way that they themselves did not prove. And if you are able to do that, um, that's what you should, like, hopefully judges then give you the win, though, of course, it, it still comes down to the round itself and also how good your opening was. But thinking about why are your points of difference most central to the round and deciding which team comes first um, is important. Um, so that is uh, uh, most of the advice I have for whip speeches, I'll, I'll stay on for about three or four more minutes just to see if any other questions come through. But uh, the main thing uh, for the speeches, uh, I would also say about whip speeches is don't try to do too much. Like you're not supposed to just try to answer everything that's been said or make every possible argument, but rather you just wanna say like, your team had one or bit two big ideas um, very clearly, why was this important and how does it interact with the three other teams and why does it put you above the others? And even if you're not able to answer every little point a team said or um, do like the most explicit bench work, if you're able to just prove like why your extension was new and how it relates to all the other teams in a way that's favorable to you, you'll win most of your rounds. Um, and the the one caveat to that being, make sure you also don't forget about where the round was before your speech as well. So making sure you, um, particularly on op whip, are spending a lot of time bringing opening gov back into the debate and talking about them and refuting them as well on their own terms is important as well. And if you do those two things, you should be able to win most of your closing rounds because you do have the advantage of 
hindsight and seeing where everything's been uh, that opening teams just don't have. And that it becomes very, very hard for an opening team to get good enough to be so good that there are very little things that a closing gun or closing off team can do in that particular round. Um, so that is all I have. Um, but also, of course, you can reach out to me privately if you'd like any other questions or things I've said, or maybe um, comment something below and I'll try to respond. But uh, thank you for watching and uh, good luck at Euros. Bye.